Hello and welcome to Morning the Narrative. I am McBulo. The show will feature the top news of the week, complete with my observations, and even a little bit of snapcasm thrown in. The top news stories will be taken from my morning news briefings that I write on the, on the Rick Bulo new media blog every weekday morning. If you go on to like what you see, smash that thumbs up button. And now, let's go right into the news. On Saturday, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg had died. And now we're just a little over six weeks away from the election. Now the question is, should President Trump put forth a nominee now or wait until after the election? I'll give my answer just after in a, in a little bit. However, let's go to the, to the to the to the Associated Press. Trump to make Supreme Court pick by Saturday before Ginsburg burial. Says President Donald Trump said Monday he expects to announce his pick for the Supreme Court by week's end, before Ruth Bader Ginsburg is buried launching a monumental Senate confirmation fight over objections from Democrats who say it's too close to the, no to the November election. Trump said he is planning to name his pick by Friday or Saturday ahead of the first presidential debate. Ginsburg ca Ginsburg's casket is to be uh, on view midweek on the iconic steps outside the court and later privately at the Capitol. She is to be buried next week in a private service at Arlington National Cemetery. Democrats, led by presidential nominee Joe Biden, are protesting the Republicans' rush to replace Ginsburg, saying voters should speak first on Election Day, November 3rd, and the winner of the White House should fill the vacancy. Trump dismissed those arguments, telling Fox and Friends, I think it would be good for the, for the Republican Party, and I think it would be good for, for everybody to get it over with. The impending clash over the vacant seat when the fill it in with whom, has scrambled the stretch run of the presidential race for a nation already reeling from the coronavirus pandemic that has killed nearly 200,000 people, left millions unemployed, and heightened partisan tensions and anger. Democrats point to the hypocrisy of the Republicans in trying to rush to a pick so close to the election after refusing to do so for President Barack Obama in February 2016 long before that year's election, Biden is appealing to GOP senators to delay, to, delay, to delay the vote until after the election. Ginsburg, 87, died Friday of metastatic pancreatic cancer. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell is pushing ahead with plans to begin the confirmation process, vowing to vote this year on Trump's nominee. With just over a month before the election, he said the Senate has more than sufficient time to handle the nomination. Trump allowed that he would accept the vote in the lame duck period after election day, but made clear his preference would be that it occur by November 3rd. Announcing a nominee on Friday or Saturday would, would leave less than 40 days for the Senate to hold a confirmation vote before the election. No nominee has won the confirmation that quickly since Senator Day O'Connor became the first woman to serve on the Supreme Court in 1981. Protesters are mobilizing for a wrenching confirmation fight punctuated by crucial key issues before the court. Healthcare, abortion access, and even the potential outcome of the coming presidential election. Some showed up early Monday morning outside the homes of key GOP senators. Trump said Monday he, he had a list of five finalists, probably four, he has promised to nominate a woman and his preference for someone younger could hold, who could hold her seat for decades. Conversations in the, in the White House and McConnell's office were increasingly, were increasingly focused on two finalists, Amy Coney Barrett and Barbara Lagoa. According, according to a person granted anonymity to discuss the private deliberations, Trump himself confirmed that they are among the top contenders. Now, Barron has become a, has long been a favorite of conservatives and was a strong contender for the seat that eventually won in 2018 to Brett Kavanaugh. 
At the same time, Trump called, told confidants that he is, or that he was, quote unquote, saving Mayor for Ginsburg's seat. Lagoa has been pushed by some aides who touted political advantages for being Hispanic and healing from the key political battleground, battleground state of Florida. Now, Trump admitted that politics may, may, may play a role. Late Monday, he gave a nod to another battleground state, Michigan, and White House officials confirmed he was referring to Joan Larson, a federal appeals court judge there. The president also indicated that, that Allison Jones rushing, a 38-year-old appellate judge from North Carolina, is on a short list. His team is also actively considering K. Todd, the White House deputy counsel who has never been a judge but was a clerk for Justice Clarence Thomas. As the Senate re returned to Washington on Monday, attention focused on Republicans Mitt Romney of Utah and Chuck Grassley of Iowa for clues to whether Trump and McConnell will be able to confirm Ginsburg's replacement anytime soon. Four Republicans could hold a, a quick confirmation and Trump criticized Senators Susan Collins of Maine and Lisa Murkowski of Alaska for opposing a vote before elections. The president warned that, that they would be quote unquote very badly hurt by voters. Trump went so far as to disparage reports that Ginsburg had told her granddaughter that it was her wish that a replacement judge not be confirmed until the inauguration of a new president. Providing no evidence, Trump suggested that Democrat pol political force were behind the, were behind the report, including, including Representative Adam Schiff, the Senate Intelligence Committee chairman who led the chamber's impeachment probe. Schiff said Trump sank to a new low with that comment. He denied any involvement in, in Ginsburg's dying wish, wish, but said he would fight like hell to make it come true. Now, a day earlier, Biden appealed to, them, to Republicans to join McCoskey and Collins in opposing a, a confirmation vote before the November 3rd election. It takes four GOP senators breaking ranks to keep Trump's nominee off the court. Uphold your constitutional duty, your conscience, said Biden, speaking in Philadelphia on Sunday. Let the people speak, cool the flames that have engulfed our country. Jamming the nomination through, Biden said, would amount to an, quote unquote, abuse of power. Senate, Dem Senate Democrat leader Chuck Schumer objected to McConnell's, quote unquote, utterly craven pursuit of a Supreme Court confirmation under such circumstances, warning it would shatter Senate norms. It's not to make your head explode, he said. The sudden vacancy is reshaping the presidential race, which to this point has, has largely been a referendum on how Trump had managed the COVID-19 pandemic. It seems certain to electrify both sides. Democrats were baking fundraising records while a packed Trump crowd in North Carolina Saturday loudly chanted fill the seat. But it, but it remains unclear if the high court vac or high bench vacancy which could impact everything from abortion rights to legal challenges to the 2020 election would provide or would persuade disenchanted Republicans to return to Trump or fire up women with suburban voters to vote for Biden. Republicans hold a 53-47 edge in the Senate. If there were a 50-50 tie, it could be broken by Vice President Mike, Mike Pence. However, there is another potential wrinkle. Because Arizona's Senate seat is a special election, that seat could be filled as early as November 30th. If Democrat Mary Kelly wins and is seated, that would narrow the window for McConnell. Now, I say wait until after the election. I mean, now, granted, granted the Constitution says that the president can, can nominate justices with the advice and consent of the Senate. However, even though it doesn't say what the time frame is, I think it would be wise to, to hold off on naming someone until after the election. And I, and I know people out there are probably gonna gonna roll their eyes at this, but you know, it, it one way or an, 
another. Trump might get his third pre his third Supreme Court justice. So ah. and okay. There are many different scenarios uh, as well. One if there is a four four tie in the in the Supreme Court, should the pre should the election go to the Supreme Court, a 4-4 deadlock could kick it, could kick, could we, could bring the, the lower court ruling into play. I'll get, I'll get more, more on that uh, probably within the week, maybe Maybe also in f in future weeks, but you know now might be a little too too early. Although, though on the other hand, there is a, a thing from the National Review that if I can pull it up on the on the share here. That says replacing Ginsburg. National National Review says Republicans should move now. While we did not agree with many of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's views about the Constitution or the judicial function, we never doubted her, ind her industry, dedication, gumption, civility, or patriotism. We send our condolences to all who mourn her passing. Justice Ginsburg almost certainly had more friends than any other justice in U.S. history with her great friend, Justice Antonin Scalia in second place. The white acclaim and white up or opprobrium for these justices is a sign of something that is long gone with, that has gone wrong in our political culture in which the Supreme Court looms largely entirely too large. Her death has therefore led not to a mourning, but to a, the start of a political convulsion. Many commentators, mostly Democrats, are saying that the Republicans have an obligation to show restraint, to leave this vacancy to be filled by whoever wins the presidential election, rather than moving forward with the nomination and hearings. They say that in 2016, when President Obama nominated Merrick Garland to replace Scalia, Republicans argued that no nomination should, should proceed right before a presidential election, and that, and that Republicans should adhere to that same principle now. They also say that if Republicans fill the seat, Democrats will, will retaliate next year by expanding the Supreme Court to add more liberals to it. The argument from 2016 is unavailing. Our own view was that the Republicans' point about acting in an, an election year was secondary to the imperative to enrich constitutionalism on the court. But the most careful articulations of the, of the Republican position in 2016 held that when the Supreme Court vacancy arose, while the White House and Senate were controlled by opposite parties and a presidential election was coming soon, the vacancy should be filled by the winner of that election. In short, the voters should be asked to break the deadlock between two branches they elected. That condition does not apply today as Republicans have won a Senate majority in three consecutive elections. It is something because it would be useful for conservatives to say the Democrats should be held to what many of them said in 2016 that the Senate had a constitutional obligation to proceed with any nomination the president made, but that argument never had any grounding in the Constitution. The notion that Republicans should calm troubled waters by standing down is a bit, it's a little more beguiling, but it should also be rejected. Supreme Court nominations have become incendiary events because the, the court has strayed so far from its proper constitutional role. There is no need to be coy. What we have in mind most of all, like just like progressive activists, is abortion. In Roe v. Wade, the court swept away the laws of the 50 states and trampled on the most fundamental of human rights, and it did it without any justification in the text, original understanding, logic, structure, or history of the Constitution. Even legal scholars who approve of the policy result have admitted as much. A court that claims that power for itself can come in and many other enormities, and the Democrat Party, very much including its current presidential nominee, maintains a litmus test that any Supreme Court nominee must, play, must pledge fealty to that anti-constitutional ruling. 
the rift between constitutional law and the Constitution has done great damage to political culture. It would be perverse to give up a chance to pull them back together because of that damage. And it would be a mistake to allow the risk of future progressive mischief to cause conservatives to refrain from taking that chance. President Trump, like President Obama in 2016, has a constitutional power to nominate a Supreme Court justice. He should exercise that power to, for, to put forward someone with a track record of respect for the law and for its limits on the, on, the judici, on, the, on the judiciary. The Senate, as it did in 2016, will then have the power to, to decide whether to proceed. If the nominee meets threshold conditions of quality and judicial philosophy, we hope it will schedule hearings expeditiously and vote whenever enough time for deliberation has passed. Now, should President Trump nominate some nominate someone now? Will it affect the way I vote for him? No. Granted, I will be a little bit disappointed in that, but still, you know, you know, he is a president and he does have that right. You know, however, with it being just under 43 days until the election, you know, you know, I say, if he wants to dominate, he can. However, let's wait, let's hold off on the confirmation until after the election because, you know, there is a, 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 a limited amount of time. And yeah, l like I said, I'll, I'll, I'll give my, I'm gonna give my opinions, more opinions that is later on, but you know, it, it's just too early to tell. We found out a few more things about the SCOTUS seat and what the president's gonna do. Let's take this from the Washington Examiner. Trump is running five women for Supreme Court and would quote, unquote, single quote unquote, rather see confirmation before election. This is from Catherine Doyle. President Trump said he is looking at five women for a Supreme Court nomination and will be meeting in person with some this week. Speaking to reporters outside the White House on Monday, Trump said that he has spoken to some of his picks today and yesterday and plans to meet with others. He also said he would probably announce his pick on Saturday. I'd much rather have a, have a vote before the election because there's a lot of work to be done and I'd much rather have it and we have plenty of time to do it. I mean, there's really a lot of time, he said. So let's say I make the announcement on Saturday. There's a great deal of time before the election. That'll be up to Mitch McConnell in the, in the Senate. But I'd certainly much rather have the vote. I think it sends a good signal and it's solidarity and lots of other things. And I'm just doing my constitutional obligation. I have an obligation to do this. So I would rather see it before the election. The five candidates that Trump has sought to be reading are federal appeals to court judges, Amy Coney Barrett, Barbara Lagoa, Joan Larson, and Allison Jones Rushing, as well as Kay Todd, Deputy Counsel to Trump and who served as Chief Counsel for the U.S. Chamber Litigation Center. Barrett and, and Lagoa are presumed to be fun runners. Lagoa, who is Hispanic and from Florida, may benefit Trump politically. Trump told reporters over the weekend, she's Hispanic and highly respected before adding Miami. And from Town Hall, this from Marin Elmore Esquire, SCOTUS 101, a crash course on the next 40 days. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was probably the first Jewish woman to serve on the United States Supreme Court. She was iconic, trailblazing, and revered. Her death is a tragedy and her legacy should be honored. The president quickly expressed his condolences and, in, in, and indicated that he would dominate a new female replacement. Seeing this contentious process to fruition won't be easy or without pitfalls, but it is possible. Here's what the loss of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the nomination of a new justice will, will look like. 
was roughly 40 days until the election, there's a major time crunch for the nomination and confirmation of a new justice. A mass filled tweet from political journalist Lisa Desjardins correctly indicates that the time is not on President Trump's side. The fastest Supreme Court nomination in the last 30 years took 42 days. The average confirmation since 1975 takes 67 days. Even the smallest delay could be extremely critical. However, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell is squarely on the side of the president and will be an expedient issue of the process. The problems of the process are not simply a matter of time, but also a matter of partisan politics. Democrats are still bruised by the Republican treatment of Merrick Garland. The Senate refused to vote on lame duck President Obama's election year Scalia replacement under the, under the guise of waiting for the election. However, Republicans control the Senate, so Democrat Obama had no leg to stand on, and Garland stood no chance. Additionally, the Appointments Clause of the Constitution empowers the President to nominate with the confirmation, advice, and consent of the Senate to, to appoint Supreme Court justices. Thus, the Constitution is on the Republican side, and it can easily be argued that a nomination and confirmation is a constitutional obligation. Putting the Constitution aside, how is this going to shake out in the Senate? Senate Republicans control 53 seats and could have four or three defections, and, and Vice President Pence could break a 50-50 tie. Now, for Senate candidates in free state competitive races in places like Arizona, Maine, Colorado, and Alabama, this means a last-minute change in strategy that will be needed to bring home a victory. The, the strategy hinges on, on these questions, vote or wait, yay or nay. These calls are crucial. These decisions are also vastly important for moderates on both sides of the aisle, or for those who don't always vote with their party. Fannin Trump and Mitt Romney, a vote against a conservative justice, would greatly upset religious constituents in his home state of Utah, yet Alaska Republican-ish and pro-choice Lisa Murkowski already said she would not vote prior to the November election. It's a smart given the justice will likely have a poor life take or be more conservative. There is also a great possibility that moderate Democrat Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia, who voted for Kavanaugh in 2018, would vote w with Republicans. The SCOTUS appointment is massively important for Democrats, Republicans, and the future of our country. Trump already, already appointed two conservative justices, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, Killing a third would mean Trump's choices upon confirmation would control one third of the court, which is significant. It would also technically bring the ideological vote of 60 to 63 in favor of conservatives. It's worth mentioning that Chief Justice Roberts was a George W. Bush appointee, but he hasn't been a shining staff for conservative decisions. Either way, the left only has Sotomayor, Kagan, and Breyer. And, and it's worth mentioning that Breyer is 82 years old and the second Trump term, term could easily mean turning 6-3 into 7-2. This terrifies Democrats, so their solution is to quote-unquote pack the court, which means adding liberal justices. The legal theory for this would be that there is no constitutional obligation to only have nine justices. It is simply a 100-year tradition. They want to place a litany of, of liberal activists on the court, now, yes, we speak of a conservative in a, in a liberal court. However, comma, the Supreme Court is not supposed to be partisan. The court is supposed to be apolitical. Part of RBG's popularity stems from a democratic activism. Such powers doesn't, fit, doesn't squarely fit within the idea of the separation of powers. But the other major problem, is, but, there's, but there's a power problem, rather, is that Democrats don't yet have the power to do anything of which they speak. They're, they're just grasping at paper straws. To pack the court, they need to legislate. To legislate, they would need both houses. They also think that waiting until November means waiting for Biden. Anyone who thinks that is a guarantee should really watch some news clips from November 2016 and pray that Biden gets through a debate. Democrats, or at least social media level activists, keep threatening the right to riot if Trump nominates a justice. The problem with continued riots is that rioting doesn't pull well, 
providing scarce suburban voters and a scarce suburban voter is a vote for Donald Trump. Now, interestingly enough, like I said yesterday, and I had just seen where conservative radio talk show host Russ Limbaugh said the same thing, is I would wait until November to, to nominate someone. You know, I, I mean, granted, like I said yesterday, a 4-4, any 4-4 ruling at the Supreme Court level means that the lower court ruling stands pat, which means that, you know, should, should, should either Trump or Biden appeal the appeal much like in 2000, you know, appeal the election much like Gore did in 2000, that would mean that whatever the, whatever the lower court or the appeals court has a, in store or had, had, had ruled is in place. So 5-4, could be detrimental to for Trump. However, you know, you know, the pragmatic side of me says, wait and see, you know, just what happens. But it is interesting, and oh, by the way, there is breaking news that that had come through today. Let me just get at it right quick here. Breaking Romney says, let's get this SCOTUS vote in now, update 51. And there, there are a couple of alternate media headlines and which one inspired by a guy Benson. Mitt Romney would suddenly reverse the previous status as a dog torturing venture capitalist. Or alternate, alternate headline via political cocaine match wins again. This by Ed Morrissey over, uh, over at, at Hot Air. Senator Mitt Romney says he was supportive of floor vote on President Donald Trump's Supreme Court, essentially clinching consideration of Trump's nominee this year, despite the impending election. Just two Republican senators have asked for the party to put the brakes on the confirmation. And with the 53 seat majority, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, Republican Kentucky, now has the votes he needs to move forward with a nominee to replace the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I intend to follow the Constitution and precedent in, in considering the president's nominee. If the nominee reaches the Senate floor, I intend to vote based on their qualifications, the Utah Republican said in a statement. There's not much more to add to this since it has up to 51, at least for now. The writing on this wall came prob prob probably came yesterday after retiring Senator Lamar Alexander declared his intent to vote for Donald Trump's Supreme Court pick. Alexander, who usually votes with the majority but likes to work across the aisle, was one of the big votes McConnell needed to harness. Poor encourager les autres, in a way. In fact, it's tough to be inspired or surprised by this decision. Romney may represent a less than enthusiastic electorate when it comes to Trump, but Utah is still deeply conservative and deeply concerned about the Supreme Court and the federal judiciary. Had Romney waffled in the face of Democrat threats and caved, what is it would have been outraged, not on Trump's behalf, but on their own behalf, and rightly so too. One has to wonder whether Susan Collins and especially Lisa Murkowski might do it now in the breach. Collins faces a tough election in Maine, so she'll, so she'll probably hang tight to a no vote, at least on the motion to proceed to a floor vote. Murkowski, however, faces a, polit a similar political climate as Romney. Alaskan Republicans already tried out her once, and her attempts to scuttle a normal process for filling a Supreme Court opening might end up being more damaging than supporting the normal process would have been. It may be that both will try to eat their cake and have it too by voting against the motion to proceed, but voting to confirm the specific nominee in the end. And Rear Romney is not hiding his thoughts by the spokesman. Here's a statement on Twitter. There's a Twitter link. 
updated in case anyone missed it yesterday. Corey Gardner threw, also threw in a support to Mitch McConnell. That's 51 in the ball game unless something changes. Then there's a tweet from Alex Salvi that says new Colorado GOP Senator Corey Gardner announces he will vote to confirm President Trump's Supreme Court nominee. So things are getting rather, rather very interesting. And we have, as of today, 41 days in change until the election. Trump said that he's going to uh, uh, put forth the nomination on Saturday. So that means that we'll be well within, or well under rather, 40 days. I don't think he, I don't think that there'll be enough time for that, especially given what happened with Kavanaugh back in October 2018. So I say let's just wait until November. I mean, granted, you know the, you know, that just means that the that the that any tie of the Supreme Court means that the means that it'll be the lower and or appellate courts rulings will stand. So let's see just what'll happen. With the debate coming up this Tuesday at nine PM Eastern on many of the major stations. It's no surprise that with Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death on Friday that one of the topics will be the, the Supreme Court. This coming from the Council for or the Commission on Presidential Debates website, moderator announces topics for first presidential debate. The first presidential debate will be held on Tuesday, September 29th at Case Western River Reserve University in Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. The format for the first debate calls for six 15-minute sessions dedicated to topics announced in advance in order to encourage deep discussion of the leading issues facing the, the country. Chris Wallace, moderator for, of the first 2020 presidential debate, has selected the topics for that debate. Now, because now subject to possible changes because of news developments, the topics for the September 29 debate are as follows. Not necessarily, not necessarily to be brought up in this order. The Trump and Biden records, the Supreme Court, COVID-19, the economy, race and violence in our cities, and the, and the integrity of the election. Note that all debates start at 9 p.m. Eastern and run, and run for 90 minutes without commercial interruption. Now, it's interesting that the, that the, that Wallace has, has these six set up, especially considering everything that's happening within the, the new system. And also, we, you know, we have this thing where, with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and speaking of that, there were a couple of things which I had not mentioned but earlier, but will. Let me just pull this up from the Daily Signal. How fast the Senate can confirm a Supreme Court nominee? The Supreme Court vacancy vacated by the death of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg forces attention on an obscure but very important process within our system of government. Namely, how does such a job op opening get filled? First, there's no manual rule book or a set of instructions. The Constitution, in fact, has very little to say about it. It gives the power to make nominations to the President and the power of advice and consent to the Senate, and the Constitution allows the Senate to determine its own rules for doing business. That's the extent of it. The Constitution doesn't tell whether the President or the Senate well, the, the Constitution doesn't tell either the President or the Senate how to fulfill their responsibilities when it comes to appointing judges. Second, every vacancy and every nomination is unique. 
justices sometimes announce months in advance and that they will set a set on a, on a specific date, while others say they won't even until their successor is finally confirmed. Vacancies can occur suddenly, as with the unexpected death of Justice Antonin Scalia in 2016, or after a long decline in the justice's health. Similarly, presidents can make a nomination quickly or take a long while to think about it. President George H.W. Bush announced his nomination of Clarence Thomas in 1991, only a few days after Justice Thurgood Marshall announced his retirement. By contrast, President Bill Clinton took more than three months to nominate Ginsburg to replace Justice Byron Wright in 1993. Third, the, the, the length and complexity of the Senate's confirmation process also vary considerably. The Justice with the, the Judiciary Committee, for example, held its first hearing on a Supreme Court nomination in, in 1916, but confirmed at least a dozen nominees after that without a hearing at all. And this coming from Thomas Dripping in a tweet, time between nomination and confirmation of some Supreme Court justices. With Peter Ginsburg in 93 took 42 days, Senator O'Connor in 81 took 33 days, John Paul Stevens, 75, in 1975, took 19 days. Lewis Powell, 1971, took 45 days. Harry Blackman, in 1970, took 27 days. Wernberger, in 1969, took 17 days. The, the committee held a hearing on eight Supreme Court justices who did not attend, including Earl Warren in 1953, Justices Stanley Reed in 1938, and William Douglas in 1939 attended their hearings but said nothing and were asked no questions. Now while he reads hearing lasted almost an hour, Douglas's was over in just five minutes. The confirmation, the entire confirmation process is sometimes over before virtually anyone knows it has begun. The Senate confirmed James Burns in 1941 on the same day that President Franklin Roosevelt nominated him. Now, four years later, Roosevelt's nomination of Hill Burton languished longer for a single day. In 1962, the Senate confirmed White without even a recorded vote, only a few hours after, the, after the, the, the Judiciary Committee held a very brief hearing. The confirmation process has taken longer in recent decades, in part because it has become more formal and complicated, vetting by the Justice Department, background checks by the FBI, and evaluations by the American Bar Association, for example, all lead to the time, or all add to the timetable. Still, some recent confirmations have been handled with great efficiency. President Gerald Ford's nomination of John Paul Stevens in 1975 just took 19 days from, confirm, from nomination to confirmation, and the Senate took 33 days to confirm President Ronald Reagan's 1981 nomination of Senator Day O'Connor. Ginsburg was confirmed in 1993, just six weeks after her nomination, while the Senate would unanimously confirm Annan Scalia in 1986. The confirmation process took 89 days because Scalia was paired with William Rehnquist, the justice that Scalia would replace, and who had been nominated to be elevated to Chief Justice. Rehnquist att attracted significant controversy, and the 65-33 Senate tally was, as a percentage of Senate votes cast, the most opposition since Justice Marilyn Pitney was confirmed in 1912. Now, there are, are more than just interesting anecdotes. They demonstrate, or these are, these are more than just interesting anecdotes. They demonstrate that there is no single way to appoint a Supreme Court justice the Constitution does not say how to do it, and even Senate rules do not establish a specific framework. The circumstances surrounding a vacancy, the politics of the time, the existing philosophical balance of the Supreme Court, and many other variables add up to the Senate handling Supreme Court nominations in at least a dozen different ways. Supporters or opponents of a particular president, or of a particular nominee, often argue that the confirmation process must mirror the, the process for this or, or that prior nominee. Those precedents might be interesting and perhaps even relevant, but they certainly are not binding. In each case, the Senate must decide how to handle a nomination when the president actually sends a nomination to the Senate. 
Now, I always say, and I, and I mean, I'll keep saying this, you, you know, that President Trump should at least wait until the lame duck session, you know, because, I mean, well, okay, to, according to his, according to the, to the schedule now, he is, ex okay, Ginsburg is, is expected to lay in repose until Friday when there's going to be a, a funeral and private internment. Trump's going to nominate his, his, his successor on Saturday, and on Tuesday, there he has the debate. So, he's, he's going to be a very busy man, and of course, you know this, and of course, the those senators that are up for re-election, and there are, I think, 33 of them this year, will be, or some of them are mired deep in their own re-election debates and whatnot, so... I say just hold off until after the election, you know, let the chips fall where they may. But found to be very interesting and as we all also see in in another uh, article, the four things to know about Supreme Court vacancies in election years, as, as the election, or as the nation stands bitterly, even violently divided with weeks to go before highly contested presidential election. Another tremor is when a Supreme Court justice of three decades dies. This leaves a Republican president and first level of the departed, the Democrat appointed justice to fill the vacancy. In this instance, the Supreme Court was not at the top of President Abraham Lincoln's priorities when Chief Justice Robert Taney died 27 days be before the election of 1864. Now to this day, the, this is the closest to the election day that a high court vacancy had occurred. When to lose election, Lincoln's term wouldn't expire until March 1865. So the process of a lame duck presidency, and I'm not sharing, hold on. Uh, now, going back, uh, win or lose election, or re-election, Lincoln's term wouldn't, wouldn't expire until March 1865, so the prospect of a long lame duck presidency loomed in those pre 20th Amendment days. After winning re-election, Lincoln in December nominated, nominated his former Treasury Secretary, Salmon Chase, to fill the vacancy on the Supreme, on the Supreme Court. The Republican-controlled Senate confirmed Chase that same month. Taney, the justice whom Chase succeeded, was confirmed by the Senate in March 1836 during an election year, but President Andrew Jackson had nominated him back in July 1835. Of the 29 times the Supreme Court vacancy has occurred in an election year, 22 different presidents nominated a replacement either before the election or in the lame duck period before the next presidential inauguration. That total will soon will be 30 as President Donald Trump is poised by this Thursday, or this Saturday rather, to nominate a successor to Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg who died Friday at 87, just 46 days before the, before the November 3 election. Here's what's to know about, about Supreme Court confirmations in presidential election years. Number one, what happens when President's party controls the Senate? Of those 29 times a vacancy on the high court occurred in an in, in election year, 19 presidents nominated a successor when their party controlled the Senate. In those cases, the Senate Majority Party confirmed their president's nomination 17 times. Most of those nominations, a, a total of 10, occurred before election day. The rest occurred after, during what, was, during what is traditionally called the lame duck session. All but one pre-election pre day nominee were confirmed. The exception came in, in 1968 when President Lyndon Johnson, a Democrat, 
nominated Justice Dave Fortas to be Chief Justice. Chief Justice Earl Warren had announced he would retire, but, re but remain on the quarter until the successor was confirmed. Fortas became engulfed in a financial scandal, prompting a bipartisan group of senators to stall a vote, even though Democrats controlled the chamber. Johnson also, also was forced to nominate Homer Thornberry to fill the court vacancy created when Fortas moved up, but did not, but did not proceed because no vacancy occurred. Like Johnson, other, pre other incumbent presidents, Barack Obama, Miller Fillmore, James Buchanan, and, and Andrew Johnson, or a a Andrew Jackson, made high court nominations in election years when they weren't running for re-election. Number two, how many presidents nominated justices while running for re-election? This is a, the situation Trump is in today. In nearly every other case, like this one, the president's party also controlled the Senate. The last time an, an incumbent president facing re-election nominated a Supreme Court justice was in 1940. It took President Franklin Roosevelt just 11 days to get the Democrat-controlled Senate to confirm Frank Murphy in January to replace Justice Pierce Butler, who had died the previous November. Besides Roosevelt, three, three other 20th century presidents may their May Supreme Court nominations when running for re-election. When the petty work controlled the Senate and all were successful, President William Howard Taft nominated Malin Pitney, who was confirmed by a Republican-controlled Senate in 1912 before Taft lost the election. President Woodrow Wilson, Taft's successor in 1916, won confirmations in a Democrat-controlled Senate of two new justices, John Clark and Lewis Brandeis, Wilson was re-elected. President Herbert Hoover, a Republican, lost to Roosevelt by a landslide in 1932, but Hoover won confirmation of Justice Benjamin Cardozo from, an, from a Republican-controlled Senate before an ugly election day for the Republican Party. The first ever such case might be a questionable example because President George Washington was elected twice by acclamation but Washington technically was in a re-election year when he nominated two men for the Supreme Court in 1796. Both of them confirmed promptly by the Senate. Washington nominated Oliver Ellsworth to be Chief Justice and Samuel Chase as Associate Justice. The Federalists, a faction most closely associated with Washington, controlled the Senate at the time. President Thomas Jefferson's Democratic Republicans controlled the Senate when he was up for re-election in, in 1804 and nominated William Johnson in March. The Senate confirmed Johnson that same month. Jefferson was re-elected late that year. President Benjamin Harrison nominated George Shiras to the High Court when his fellow Republicans held on a Senate majority and they confirmed Shiras in July 1892. Harrison lost his re-election bid. Four months or well, four years earlier, Democrat Grover Cleveland convinced the Republican Senate to confirm Melville Fuller as Chief Justice in the middle of the 1888 presidential election campaign. Cleveland lost re-election. Now what happens when the opposition party controls the Senate? Of the 10 times a president nominated, nominated a justice when the opposing party controlled the Senate, only two of the nominees were confirmed. Of those instances, the president nominated a replacement before election day six times. The most recent example, of course, was President Barack Obama's nomination of Merrick Garland to fill the vacancy of Justice Antonin Scalia, who died in February of 2016. The Republican-controlled Senate declined to hold a confirmation hearing for Garland Trump, as the new, new president elected that November, successfully nominated Neil Gorsuch. The Whig controlled Senate shot down four of President John Tyler's five high court nominees in 1844, but it confirmed Samuel Nelson as a justice during the lame duck session of, 18, of February 1845. Tyler and the Whig Congress were fierce opponents. President, Mill M president Millard Fillmore had three nominations rejected by the Senate in 1852. Two other presidents whose party was out of control in the Senate failed to get high court nominees confirmed in the lame duck session. 
These were John Quincy Adams in 1829 and James Buchanan in 1861. Republican Rutherford B. Hayes elected president in 1876 in a controversial outcome. Saw his party lose the Senate in the lame duck session in early 1881. Hayes secured one confirmation to the Supreme Court, Stanley Matthews, but lost another, William Woods. In cases that overlaps categories with regard to an election year, President Dwight Eisenhower faced a Democrat-controlled Senate in 1956 and what was reported as an appeal to the Catholic vote. Eisenhower recess appointed William Brennan to the High Court in October 1956, just or shortly before his last re re-election. The Democrat Senate confirmed Brennan in March 1957. And in another case that doesn't easily fit, President Ronald Reagan nominated Anthony Kennedy to the Supreme Court in November of 1987 after pre two pre previous failed nominations to fill the seat of Justice Lewis Powell, who retired in June 1987. The Democrat Senate confirmed Kennedy in February 1988. Now, what presidents made lame duck picks after the, after the election? The most con consequential lame duck nomination was President John Adams's successful appointment of fellow Federalist John Marshall to be Chief Justice in January 1851, after Adams lost re-election to Jefferson in his final days as president in March 1837, Jackson, a two-term Democrat, secured Senate confirmations of two high court nominees, John Catron and William Smith. Jackson's successor, Democrat Merton Van Buren, lost his re-election bid in 1840, but managed to get the Democratic-controlled Senate to confirm his nominee, Peter Daniel, to the High Court in February 1845. After winning re-election in 1872, President Ulysses S. Grant nominated Ward Hunt to the Supreme Court and saw him confirmed by the Republican-controlled Senate that in December. After losing re-election, Benjamin Harrison, nevertheless, got Howell Jackson confirmed for the High Court in February 1893. And after winning re-election to a full term, President Kevin Coolidge named Justice Helen Stone in January 1925. He was confirmed the next month. So yes, there have been nominees can push forward in, in, during a lame duck session. And, you know, with, with us being just inside of 40 days until the election. We're seeing it all come. We're seeing everything up in the air. So who knows what will happen. However, I will be here to, to bring you the, the news as it happens. Given everything that's happening with the Supreme Court, the, decision and nomination. Trump is going to give his choice for a Supreme Court justice on Saturday. He predicts that the Supreme Court will decide the outcome of the election. This from foxnews.com. Trump predicts Supreme Court will decide outcome of election as he pushes quick confirmation. President Trump on Wednesday predicted the U.S. Supreme Court may decide the outcome of November's presidential election, highlighting the importance he's put, that he's put on the Senate quickly confirming his eventual nominee. Now, in order to prevent a 4-4 split on potential election-related issues, Trump suggested during a roundtable event that lawmakers should take swift action on his candidate, who he is expected to be announced on Saturday. I think this will end up in the Supreme Court, Trump told reporters, and I think it's very important that we have nine justices. Now, while the winner of a presidential election is generally called just hours after polls close, the coronavirus pandemic has shifted the landscape and is forcing millions of Americans to vote by mail, which means final results may not be known until days after the election. The president has voiced concerns about mail-in voting, which he has repeatedly claimed could lead to voter fraud. Judge Amy Coney Barrett, who, is a, who was appointed to the 7th 
U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals by Trump in 2017. Is a likely front runner for the vacant seat. House Republicans wrote a letter to the president on Wednesday pushing him to nominate Barrett. Another top contender is Robert Lagoa, a Cuban American who serves on the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. The president has said he would nominate a woman and is reportedly considering five people, all of them he called as quote unquote billion on Wednesday. Trump has already appointed conservative justices Brett Kavanaugh and Neil Gorsuch during his term. Ginsburg died Friday at the age of 87 from metastatic pancreatic cancer complications. Ginsburg was appointed to the High Court in 1993 after being nominated by former President Bill Clinton. Now, it, it's interesting. I mean, okay. Trump has had said, and it was posted at the beginning of the or Trump didn't say, but the article did say that the winner of a presidential election is generally called just hours after polls closed. That's true. The only time that it, well, I think the only two times that it hasn't was naturally 2000 with the uh, with the hanging chads debate in Florida. And also I believe the 1876 election was, was the same way. If any of you have, have any comments on that, please post them in the comments below. And let, yeah, just let me know about that. But I think though, I think those are the, were two of the times that I know of that uh, that it had, had gone that far, but yeah, I mean it. Things are things are getting rather hairy. Like I said, you know, we're only about thirty, just inside of thirty-nine days until the election, so. Things are really starting to take shape, and there. And speaking of of the Senate, you know we have the debate between Democrats and Republicans about how the about how the about how when Obama had wanted to made his nominee. Merrick Garland pushed forth in, in 2016 after Scalia died in February. And Republicans were like, whoa, slow your roll. You know, and now the Democrats are saying, now the Democrats are accusing the Republicans and particularly Majority Leader McConnell of being hypocrites. It, it it's amazing how how turned around things are. This this article from Hot Air just says that all this from Ed Morrissey over there. McConnell let us list all the ways in which Schumer is a quote unquote uniquely non credible messenger on judicial reforms. Talk about bringing receipts. Some Democrats have finally begun to back away from attacking the process of filling an open Supreme Court seat, but not Chuck Schumer. He spent most of his time the last few days attacking Mitch McConnell for hypocrisy, fair enough, and for destroying the norms of the Senate regarding its role in the federal judiciary, which is utterly absurd. McConnell set the record straight on norm busting in the upper chamber and Schumer's long history of it. In a floor speech this morning, this was yesterday's article. Schumer may want to pretend this started in 2016, but McConnell notes exactly when and how this generational food fight over judicial or confirmation started and who started it. It was Senate Democrats who began our modern challenges with the achievement of Robert Bork in 1987, but the acrimony really got going in the early 2000s when a group of Senate Democrats took the almost never used tactic of filibustering nominations and turned it into a constant routine for the first time ever. 
who was a driver, who was the main driving force behind those tactics? Let's consult some newspaper, some New York newspapers from the year 2003. Quote, Schumer decided to put ideology on the front burner of the confirmation process. I am the leader of the filibuster movement, and you know I'm proud of it, said the senator from Brooklyn. Quote, Mr. Schumer urged Democrat colleagues to use a tactic that some were recently reluctant to pursue and that has since roiled the Senate. Throughout President Bush 43's two terms, our colleague built an entire brand or an, an entire personal brand out of filibustering judicial nominees. Talented, hardworking people's careers were destroyed. Like the brilliant lawyer Miguel Estrada, a close friend of now Justice Elena Kagan, who he says is extraordinary and, a close, and thoughtful and would have made an excellent choice to any federal court, people like that destroyed by the Democrats' tactics. This version of the non-Democrat leader said filibustering judges was an essential part of the Senate. He said that if Republicans ever use a nuclear option to single quote unquote, change the rules of mainstream because single quote unquote, they can't get their way on every judge, it'll be a doomsday for democracy. But of course, in the very next presidential administration, the Democrat leader leapt at the chance to press that quote unquote doomsday button himself. Democrats have no one but themselves to blame for turning the judicial nomination process into a brute force majoritarian war issue. Schumer and Harry Reid literally created that with their 2013 rule change eliminating the filibuster from presidential appointments, including all judicial nominee nominations, except to the Supreme Court. That was a safe enough bet for Democrats at the time, since Republicans routinely voted in significant numbers for Democrats. Supreme Court nominees and even appellate court app appointments, while Democrats usually united in scorched earth votes on nominations made by Republicans. The, they only got burned by it in 2017 when McConnell removed the Supreme Court exception by following the president set by Reed and Schumer in 2013. As I wrote the other day, it is not enough to imagine that we would have three seats open at the moment on the Supreme Court without that 2017 change. Schumer could, would have used a filibuster to block anyone nominated by Trump otherwise. Schumer's complaint about McConnell's 2017 move is akin to a toddler's lament of, Mom, he hit me back. No one will, hold, will argue that this is a healthy environment. Of course, it would, be, it would be far better to return to a political environment where the two parties acknowledge the authority of a president to nominate jurors of his or her choice and where the Senate restrained itself to considerations of competence and ethics rather than policy and politics. The author of this change in an environment isn't Mitch McConnell, however, no, one, no matter how much Schumer and his progressive allies protest otherwise. Now, I mean, it, it's all just a matter of you know, anything that they do will, will just come back and bite them in the, in the butt later on down the, down the line. I mean, Schumer had done this, you know, holding off on the, on the Supreme Court, which he, he could see was fairly decent at that time. However, when McConnell removed that, all hell broke, broke, broke loose, and we're seeing the aftermath of, uh, of that now. Like I said, Saturday is when Trump's going to nominate his their Supreme Court justice. The 29th is the debates. We're coming close on the election. And everything's just coming to a head. So... Who knows what will happen? With 39 days left until the election, there's a lot at stake. What is truly at stake? This coming from our good friends at the Washington Free Beacon. It's entitled, What's Really at Stake in 2020? The death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg has clarified what is at stake in the 2020 election. It is not, as some believe, democracy itself, 
nor is it as, as others assume that I will continue the existence as a nation. Democracy will survive Donald Trump, and the United States of America will, out, will outlast Joe Biden. The question that 2020 will help to answer is what sort of democracy and what sort of nation America will be as it prepares to enter the second quarter of the 21st century. The reaction to Ginsburg's death and to Republican plans to fill a seat on the Supreme Court underscores the choice before the electric. Does it prefer to live in a democratic republic order toward the, the principles of the founders and the, in the constitutional structure they, they designed to protect individual liberty? Or would it rather, or would it rather dwell in a plebiscitary democracy where the original meaning of the constitution, when it is not explicitly repudiated, is politely overlooked in order to satisfy a more radical egalitarian demands. Needless to say, the answer is up in the air and has been for some time, but we may be nearing a settlement one way or another. The civil unrest for, of the past few months has made unignorable the existence of a large body of opinion that holds something is terribly wrong with America as founded something that cannot be redeemed, and that American history and American institutions must be drastically revised to atone for the injustices committed against racial minorities. President Trump, in his inimitable way, has made the, the opposite argument and called for a renewed appreciation of the American story and a resurgence of national pride. Ginsburg passing heightened the tension Suddenly, an abstract cultural debate was transformed into a concrete political legal struggle, and the prospect for the lasting victory for one team, Trump and Mitch McConnell's, looked real. The fight over the Supreme Court vacancy Ginsburg left behind also eliminated the lengths to which some progressives are prepared to go to make real their vision of the future, and it is in their openness to institutional upheaval that the real input of this election may be found. If enacted, the input of this election, or if enacted, the measures these Democrats propose would warp our constitutional system. They would turn the American government into a creature far different from the one the founders made. It would be the upshot of the structural reform, quote unquote, that until the last week, live mainly on Twitter and in the heads of policy wonks. These Democrats say that if President Trump's nominee to replace Ginsburg is confirmed, and that in next year brings a Democrat president and a Democrat Senate, then the first order of business for the new government in the middle of a pandemic and a troubled economy would be abolishing the legislative filibuster and packing the Supreme Court by adding anywhere from two to four justices. Such a move which even the greatest president of the 20th century was able to, was unable to achieve, would polarize this country even more than it already is, and he legitimize the court in the eyes of millions. But it is just the start of what some on the Democrat left would like to accomplish. The Electoral College has been on the chopping block since 2000. If it goes way of the dodo, presidential campaigns thereafter will be determined by who has the greatest allegiance in the largest, in the biggest cities of the largest states to override the supposed Republican advantage in the Senate, where every state enjoys virtual represent or equal representation. Some progressives would grant statehood to Washington, D.C. and to Puerto Rico, and mayhap Guam and American Samoa while they're at it. These changes would make it much easier for Congress to eliminate private health insurance and that universal vote by mail decarbonize, quote unquote, the economy, grant citizenship to illegal immigrants and voting rights to non-citizens, suppress political speech, resume taxpayer funding of abortion, and cross out the Second Amendment. The sheer number of bad ideas in play would be overwhelming. Now it's true that at least the first item on this agenda would be debated according to the present rules, and the multiple veto votes within the American plagiocracy would no doubt interfere with and sometimes append the boldest plans of the progressive Democrats. It is also the case that incorporating new states 
gives rise to challenges both constitutional and we really were willing to grant the remaining residents of the Federal District of Columbia, the first family, re electoral votes, as well as political. Does Puerto Rico we even want to be a state? But the very fact that we are having this conversation at all, and that Biden, as of the, at this writing, has neither ruled out the court packing scheme nor said whom he would nominate to the court, are seriously to worry defenders of the Founders' Constitution. In 1963, the first chapter of the Conservative Affirmation, Wilmore Will, Kendall offered his definition of American conservatism. Conservatives, Kendall wrote, oppose a liberal revolution that would replace representative government with majoritarian democracy. Put an end to liberals' assist to rural over-representation over in the lower house of Congress and in the state legislatures, bringing them in line with the principle of one man, one vote, one man, one equal vote, and that principle once adopted in his French political philosophy, not American, must call finally for abolition even of the U.S. Senate as a check on majorities, and would in any case make the House a creature of numerical majorities at the polls, abolish the Electoral College, the liberals insist further, and so make the President more also the direct agent of the popular majority, reform the party system, the liberals insist still further, so that each of our parties shall be program, pro, programmatic, ideological, like those of the single quote unquote real democracies in Europe, and that the two parties together shall submit at election time a genuine choice to, to the electorate. Abolish the filibuster, so runs the next point in, in the program, because the first rate serves no other function except to frustrate the will of the majority. Within the seniority principle in congressional committees, the program continues. It also obstructs the will of the majority. Now give the liberal attackers their way on all these points in the form of government explicated in the Federalist Papers will be no more. That is what 2020 is about. Now, interestingly enough, that is probably a, a, a very well, well, well written, that is a well written article and one that we all should pay real close attention to. I mean, I know that we are within 39 days until the election, so we have various things to things to go to go by. Hold on. And we, and I mean, this, well, every election is crucial. That article underscores that this election is very crucial, you know, and no, no matter what we, we need to vote now, whether you vote Republican, Democrat, third party, you know, just get out there and vote regardless, you know, may, make your voice heard. I know I am and I know that I'll be e eagerly awaiting the, this Tuesday's debate and, and find out just what Trump and Biden have to say. And that's going to do it for the news for this week. I am Mick Bulo. Again, if you like what you watch, please go ahead and hit the thumbs up button. Also subscribe and tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell an enemy or two even. And I will be back next week. Until next time, peace.